Hi YouTube, um, this is my first blog post, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to talk to you about this book, it's Convergence Culture, and if you don't hate reading nonfiction, I'd actually recommend giving it a try. It's a little out of date by now, it was published in 2005, but it's still pretty interesting if you like reading about what's going on with the media and things like that. To be honest, if you're on here for more than funny videos of cute animals, it'll probably tell you something you didn't know about what you've been involving yourself in. Personally, I find media culture fascinating in that whole, what do they think they're doing here way. This book definitely serves to illustrate the way that mainstream media and new media are colliding. Now, I do think that the book is perhaps a little too starry-eyed in prediction, predicting the future of this convergence culture, but I also think that it does a fairly good job of analyzing the direction, if not the outcome. Rather than do a more typical review, I'd like to demonstrate exactly how valid and useful this book is. To that end, I'm going to walk you through the individual chapters of the book, talking a bit about my experiences that are similar and really illustrate just what Jenkins, the author, is talking about. Chapter 1 is titled Spoiling Survivor, and it discusses the cult culture that grew up around the practice of trying to guess who was going to get booted and who was going to win the well-known reality TV show Survivor. Now, I was never really into Survivor, and certainly was never that into it, so I can't really speak specifically about the subject of the chapter. I can, however, relate to much of what Jenkins says in it. His basic premise is that we use the internet to group together to take advantage of the knowledge of others who share our interests, and that can often go contrary to what the media would prefer. This I know intimately. I'm an owner of two retired racing greyhounds and a member of a number of local, national, and international forums regarding the breed. When Massachusetts brought up a measure to ban greyhound racing in the state and permanently shut down the two tracks there inside of a year, all of those boards lit up. Now, you might think that we, as adopters, were almost unanimously in favor of the bill having saved our dogs from inhumane conditions. Of course, that's also what the media pushed. On the contrary, though, a large number of us disliked the bill. Why? Because we knew that it gave us one year to find as many places as possible for the huge number of dogs that were going to be displaced by the enactment of the bill. There was an even attempt made to delay the legislation and give the tracks a chance to slowly shut down over three years, something that would have made the lives of rescues much easier. And that was as supported by our forums as it was panned by the media. Of course, there was some dissent. But in general, the forums worked as a means of collective knowledge, where the knowledge of a few members had of the actual conditions of the tracks and adoption groups of the area was dispersed. Other information regarding adoption groups in other states was returned, and generally helpful information was thrown into the mix. Not only was di information directly opposed to what the majority of media outlets were reporting disseminated, but considerations were given to things that the media didn't even talk about. Chapter 2, titled Buying American Idol, discusses the new approach of the media, particularly television, with regard to consumers. Again, it's talked about in a way that I can't relate to directly, as I've never really been into American Idol or any similar shows. That being said, the idea that television broadcast companies are having to put an effort to make into making their shows appeal to me and my fellow consumers does ring a bell for me. I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I watched something just because it was on. I have so many other options just on other channels, as well as a plenitude of things I can watch on the internet. I want a show that will give me what I want, whether that's mindless zoning out or more active involvement. A lot of the shows I watch are chosen because they educate me about one subject or another. Other shows I watch because they stimulate debate with whomever I'm watching them with. I watch a few shows mostly so that I can talk about them with my mother during our weekly phone calls. Gone are the days when broadcasters could just put what they had on the air and expect a certain percentage of the population to tune in. Jenkins says it well. With so many options for home entertainment, we're stretching our time across a number of different media, and so broadcasters and advertisers need to think smart and give us what we want to keep our attention. Chapter 3, In Search of the Origami Unicorn, sadly lost me for a while as I couldn't relate to any of the movies being discussed. I only saw The Matrix years after it had come out, missing out on all the hype and the cross-media promotion. I had never seen Casablanca at all. Even the discussion about manga was far beyond my experiences with the media. I have some familiarity with the crossing over of manga and anime, but that is limited at best. That being said, I did see another instance of something that I am familiar with in my own life that fills many of the forms that Jenkins lays out, and it's something that I think a lot of people more my age can relate to. Pokemon started out as a TV show, but it has moved through many other media, including video games, card games, movies, an interactive website, and manga. 
all of these tell different parts of the stories of the world of Pokemon, and they all drew people in through the interaction. Now, when I was younger, I was mostly into the games, both video and card. That being said, I watched the an anime and the movies sometimes because I thought it might help me with the games. Now that I'm older, I pretty much stick to the occasional hours spent on the video games, but the draw is still there. I want to know more about these pretend creatures and involve myself in their lives. This draw, I think, is exactly what Jenkins is talking about with The Matrix, just aimed at kids. Chapter 4 is called Quentin Tarantino's Star Wars, and it discusses the phenomenon of fan contributions to the well-known world built by George Lucas. Again, this is something I had a hard time relating to, as I've only really watched the movies by Lucas himself. That being said, it isn't difficult to realize how big the fan commu community surrounding the movies is when you go into a bookstore and see the variety of books that have been written by a variety of authors and then bought by the media companies that own the rights to Star Wars. One of the things I found that I agree with the most is that Jenkins highlighted that while this phenomena is definitely being highlighted and enhanced by the coming of new media, it is not caused by it alone. It is simply that those who would previously be involved in fan activities mostly on their own are now able to connect with others of the same thinking, and even influence those who aren't quite as into it to feel that they can involve themselves more. Chapter 5, Why Heather Can Write, deals with a subject that I can finally relate to, the immense immersive culture of Harry Potter and the series of fans. I'm only somewhat involved personally in the fan community, but I do take part in some fan fiction writing, and am familiar with some of the sites, including Fiction Alley and the HP Alliance. I felt that Jenkins did his best to approach the subject fairly through the lens of convergent culture, and he made some points about the power of the culture, and especially the youth involved in the fan culture, that I can truly understand, having found comfort in the very culture he talks about when I was younger. I do wish Jenkins had been a bit less overtly fair when, he, when discussing the conservative Christian attempts to censor the books, because although he did express some potentially good reasons why they would do so, he gave those reasons far more weight than I think is entirely fair. He also seemed to gloss over some of the more ridiculous claims, such as though that said, those that said the semi-neo-pagan background for the books would erode children's morality. As someone who has, free, has to frequently deal with Christians treating me like some baby-eating, puppy-killing maniac simply because I am not Christian, and that is a horror, I know. I think Jenkins missed out on what their real problem was, namely that the books made some of their children ask questions and challenge their moral indoctrination. Free thinking must be banned, after all, otherwise the kids won't grow up to pay their 10% tithes. I may be a bit harsh yet, but yes, but really, of all the things I have been accused of, none of them are true. Chapter 6, the last true chapter of the book, is entitled Photoshopping Democracy, and is the only chapter that I could truly not relate to in any way. I think that a lot of this is because it deals primarily with the Americanized concept of democracy, something that is only now beginning to slowly leak into Canadian politics. Added to that, I don't participate in any games or communities where voting is a common event, so I have not experienced his alternate examples. I have to admit that I was a little disappointed to find that the last topic covered by Jenkins was one I couldn't really get, but after an otherwise strong offering, that was a minor issue at worst. What I really enjoyed about the book is that even though I have never been involved in what he discussed in five of the six chapters, I could still see his point reflected in my own experiences. Even with the sixth chapter discussing a seemingly purely American phenomenon, I could understand the point Jenkins was making, even if I had nothing I, that could illustrate it in my own life. I think that this book is an excellent resource for anyone interested in being involved in any of the major media, and I also think it's pretty interesting reading in and of itself. Although I think that a lot of the concepts are drawn from specialized interest groups, and most of those groups are varied enough that most people can't relate to all or maybe even any of the specialized examples, Jenkins also spends the time to explain the very basic idea of what he's trying to illustrate so that people like me can come along and say, oh, okay, so that's like this. So, YouTube, if you want to understand how new, old, and popular media are combining and have done so in the past, you might want to pick up Conver Convergence Culture from a local library or bookstore. It will definitely at least give you a start into your research.